It's uh, w Wednesday night, and we're in a study. It seems like most of my messages crisscross and run into each other because this book is one word. We're trying to pronounce it as it comes together. We've been working on the spiritual Sabbath. The Bible speaks of a spiritual Sabbath. The Sabbath is not literal. The Sabbath is an Old Testament shadow. Sabbath is an Old Testament shadow. Where did I get that? Out of the Bible. Colossians, the second chapter says, Colossians 2, back over there very quickly. I've had people, I had one guy say, well, the Sabbath was, uh, was, uh, was not a shadow. It was the very image. No, it's not. And Colossians says so. I had people say crazy things to me. One guy said, one guy said to me that the tithe was spiritual and said it was nomos. And nomos is the Greek word law. How in the world can you give 10% of the law? Besides that, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, that Paul said, if I minister unto you, if I minister unto you, spiritual things I come preaching spiritual things it's no great thing that you should minister unto me carnal things and carnal is just the word fleshly nothing wrong with the word carnal if you don't make your spiritual things carnal carnal sarkikos s-a-r-k-i-k-o-s well sarkikos comes from sarks which means flesh now, when we eat food, that's fleshly. It's not spiritual. Uh, when we drive a car, that's to get to work. That's flesh. It's not spiritual. And what the Bible says here over in, people open their mouths before they find out what the Bible says. You know that? Old Robert said he saw a 900-foot Jesus out by his prayer tower in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's just like some little old lady saying, I saw Jesus by my bed last night. Uh, he came into my bedroom and talked to me. I keep saying she was probably smoking something right before that because Jesus himself said in Matthew, the 24th chapter, these guys don't check what they're saying. Jesus said, if anyone says, lo here or there, or he's in the desert, Jesus said, go not forth, because the next time the world sees me, it'll be as the lightning shines from the east to the west. So if anyone says they're seeing Jesus, Jesus said, no, it'll be as the lightning shines from the east to the west. Next time I make an appearance, every eye shall see him. Great day in the morning. And look here in uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Now this really astounds me. Uh, when somebody, this guy said, well, maybe the Sabbath is, uh, is, is spiritual. Well, the, the Sabbath today is spiritual, but one in the Old Testament, the Bible says here, he's telling the, Cor the Colossian Gentile church, verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat, that's Jewish meats, or Jewish drinks, or in respect of a holy day, or of a new moon, or of a Sabbath day, which are a shadow. I wonder what that says. Let me see. Or a Sabbath day, which is a shadow. All the Sabbath days are skia, and the very image, this is what Hebrews 10 and 1 says. The law having a shadow of good things to come. That's all the things they literally celebrate over here. And not the very image. The very image icon. 
the very representative icon. It's what it represents. This is the shadow over here, and this is the real over here. Now, we've been talking about this, and we've gotten into it by telling you that there is, there is a shadow, and the real thing casts the image. Here's the real thing over here. And it looks like it's casting it backwards to the Old Testament. But it's not. When you go outside, you're the image and you cast the shadow. Well, you're here first, aren't you, as the image? When you're in, when you're in the room here and you're not outside in the sun, you come first and then when you go out there, you cast the shadow. How is it that we cast the shadow back here and how come this is the shadow? That's because we were before the shadow in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. He has predestined us, pro horizo. This really amazes me, pro horizo. That's the word predestinate. In the Greek text, it comes from pro. And horizo, pro means before, and horizo means to bound, but it means to bound inside the, that's a little diacritical mark, and it has an H sound, a breathing sound, horizo, and horizo, notice how this all fits together. The Latin's added an N to it, and it's our word, horizon, or God has pre-horizoned us to come out of the darkness here, the shadow, and to come into the light of his, the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. But this was all in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. He had already started casting the shadow beforehand because he's chosen us before the world began to be inside the light. And that has to do with, with the shadow is not the real thing. The real thing is you and I in the mind of God before the world began. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So the real was here in the mind of God long before we existed. Now, we're seeing this. We're talking about the spiritual, the spiritual Sabbath. And we're talking about, boy, there's a lot to this. We're talking about Israel. Watch. Here's the shadow. This is Israel here. And that ain't the way it's shaped. I could do better than that. But that'll be good enough. Now, and here's Egypt. And here's the Mediterranean Sea. It's just like over here, like so. It's like, well, let me see here. Here's Israel. Here's the Mediterranean Sea in here, right here. And here's Egypt. And there's Libya. Here's, this is what we call Turkey. They called it Asia Minor. Here's Greece, and there's Rome. Rome looks like a little boot right there, like so. There's Sicily. And Athens is right here. Paul's missionary journeys, he went on his journeys. His first journey came up here to Antioch, down to Cyprus, up here to Pisidia, or Pamphylia right in here also. And then he went up here to Galatia. Galatia, he went to uh, Antioch. Then he went to Iconium. Lystra, that's where they stoned him, tried to kill him. And Derby. And then he went back there and came back home. Then on his second journey, starting there in the end of the 15th chapter of Acts, he comes up here, comes up to Lystra about right there, picks up Timothy to be, to be his permanent companion, and he drops Timothy off, at least his permanent friend, drops him off at Ephesus for him to be the pastor at Ephesus, and then Titus ends up pastoring over here at Crete right here, and Timothy, Timothy and Titus, they wrote their epistles 
the epistles of first and second Timothy and Titus and they're called pastoral epistles because these two men Titus and Timothy were pastoring these churches respective churches at Ephesus and Crete now now we're talking about the shadow and the very image in the Old Testament Israel and Egypt here Egypt you can see it right here this area here there's the uh, there's the Delta land here's uh, and this is the Red Sea right here where Moses crossed somewhere he left Egypt came over here and probably crossed up here somewhere where the sea was narrow but it didn't have to be narrow for God to deliver them and this right here is the Sinai Peninsula like so well, let me get this pretty close to right like uh, and all the time when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt he begins his journey in Exodus the 12th chapter that's the last you had one two three four five down to ten plagues that come upon Egypt in order to soften the heart of Pharaoh to cause him to let the people go but each time God would say I will harden his heart and he will not let the people go and he kept hardening his heart until finally he brings the tenth plague upon Egypt to soften his heart and he softens his heart and he says I will let them go let go at the Passover and that's the last plague that was brought upon Egypt was the death of the firstborn and they had to put the blood there in Exodus the 12th chapter had to put the blood upon the doorpost in order for the firstborn to be delivered when the death angel came through the land it was probably Michael uh, that's who we consider to be the death angel and when he comes through the land he kills all the firstborn including those at the house of Pharaoh well that softens Pharaoh's heart and then God God lets lets causes Pharaoh's heart to be softened and they take off and they get to the Red Sea right here somewhere in this neighborhood right here and then God in that time hardens Pharaoh's heart again so he says let's go get them they can't do this to us if you notice each time it was God hardening his heart he did not harden his own heart God I, you know what I believe his heart was hardened about his pride you're not going to do that to me well they take off across the Red Sea and God is leading them well they get over here across the Red Sea and they head down south towards the mountain of God Mount Sinai and then when they leave Sinai they start complaining as soon as they get over across the sea into this land of Sinai Peninsula and the entire 40 years is going to be spent in this peninsula here's where Israel wandered for 40 years but they go down here they start complaining start complaining about everything and that entire journey is a picture in the New Testament of believers and unbelievers in the church and God is going to have to it's actually a picture of the inner man Christ that's the believers the belief and the outer man which serves the law of the flesh that's what Paul said in Romans the seventh chapter this is a picture and this outer man the inner man is Christ in you 
And that inner man is going to believe throughout our journey in this life, which is equated with the time that Israel was in the wilderness. And what's going to have to happen? God is going to have to kill all of these complainers. He's going to have to kill all the murmuring, murmuring, all the complaints, and all of the griping. And he's going to have to bring those believers. Now, we look at it like it's two different people, but it was two different people over here. It was actually two different people. It was those that did not believe God, and all they did was gripe all the time they were in the wilderness. And over here, the believer who complains He's going to have to kill off all of his complaints, all of his murmuring, murmuring. And the way it's going to happen is years of trial and persecution until... And this is what God did to Israel in the wilderness. They wandered for 40 years, and four is a very significant number in the Bible. Four, they, the Jews said any multiple of 10, 100, or 1,000 was a form of the original number. Those were forms of one. 40 is a form of four. The, and 400 is a form of four. Israel was in Egypt 400 years. And they were in the wilderness 40 years. And you're going to find these 400s and fours. And the four judgments of God were the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. The beast was Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. God says, I'm going to send the sword, your enemies against you, David said, Deliver me from the wicked, which is thy sword in thy hand. There in Psalm 17. The famine, that's economy, a shortage of food. Uh, this is war here against the people of God. And pestilence is a disease of all kinds. And the disease that we have, God says, Therefore will I make thee sick and smiting thee because of thy sin. And then the beast, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. God says, I will put Israel under these these judgments until I cause them to begin to rest, to rest in all of the things that they're going through. As you get older, I'm at a place in my late 70s where I rest. I used to not rest. I, I never rested. I was constantly fighting my enemies and and uh, wanting to fight and wanting to defend myself when I was right. A guy wrote me a letter, an uh, email, and he said, you mean you're not supposed to defend yourself? Well, you're supposed to go to a situation lawfully. If somebody's trying to break in your house, call the police. Don't get a gun out and start shooting at people. And he said, well, what a, uh, I think we're supposed to defend ourselves. The Bible said, as a lamb to slaughter as a sheep before his shears is dumb, he opened out his mouth. Let's be more like Christ. If you go out there to defend yourself, watch out. It may not be defense. It may be your pride you're, you're defending. Now, I'm trying to point out to you everything that Israel went over here, they complained, and God said, they won't enter into my rest. And he was speaking of the spiritual Sabbath, and he talks about that over there in Hebrews, the third and the fourth chapter. I'm trying to s really get this down for you because we're going to look at the fighting and arguing that Israel did with God over here and how we do the same thing over here because we got more of the outer man when we come to believe than we do the inner man, which is Christ in you. We have oligos pistis. That's the word puny faith. 
Jesus kept saying to the apostles, they were a bunch of young kids when he called them to follow him. He kept saying, O ye of Oligospistus, puny faith. Your faith has to grow. If it doesn't grow, you don't belong to God. He's going to cause it to grow and to, as, as you wipe away that outer man. You're not going to do it. God's going to do it in you. He's going to get rid of contention and strife and pride and arrogance and self and just being proud and lifted up. It's going to take a lot of fire, a lot of trials, a lot of for, a lot of judgments of God. And God had to put Israel through it in the Old Testament. And you're going to find this journey, most of what we're going to study, we're going to find that in the book of Numbers. Now, let me just give you a little, little rundown here. Genesis 1 through 50 is from Adam until Joseph when he's sold into Egypt. Joseph. And then you got, and this is somewhere in the neighborhood. You've got 400 years after that. This is in the neighborhood of 2,300 years from Adam until they come out of the wilderness at the hand of Moses. It's about 1,700 years from Moses being born till Jesus' birth. You've got more years in the book of Genesis than you do the rest of the Old Testament put together. Now, then after Genesis, they go into bondage at the end of Genesis. Uh, when Joseph dies, a new Pharaoh rises up that doesn't know, didn't know Joseph. It didn't mean he didn't know about him because Joseph had saved Egypt and the civilized world from starvation with his ideas on storing up grains when he was made second in command in Egypt. Now, then Moses leads the children out. He sends ten plagues, and they start in the fourth chapter, and they carry on all the way through the twelfth chapter. Well, each time God would send a plague, the people would... Uh, Moses would go and say, are you going to let my people go? And they would say, and Pharaoh, God would harden his heart and say, no, I'm not going to let them go. And each one of those plagues was about attacking the gods of Egypt. Look at, look at the 12th chapter of, of Exodus. 12th chapter. And it'll tell you that's exactly what it was. The river turning to blood... That was the Nile River turning to blood. And, and the Nile River was one of their gods. Having darkness, uh, when God brought the darkness, that was also one of their gods. They had a beetle god when all those bugs got loose in Egypt. Every one of these were gods that God was attacking. And you can start and go through this from Exodus 1. And they had a locust god, and they had locusts in Egypt at that. But look over here in verse 12 of chapter 12 of Exodus. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I'm attacking their gods. If those are real gods, you call upon your gods to deliver you. You can't deliver from Jehovah God. So, they leave Egypt in that, it doesn't take them long to start complaining. In that uh, 12th chapter, they leave Egypt, they get all their goods together in that, uh, in that 13th, in, excuse me, in the 13th chapter, and they're backed up against the Red Sea in the... 14th chapter. This is where they start griping. Now, got to realize, God has destroyed, he has killed all the firstborn in Egypt, sent all these plagues in Egypt, and 
the chapter 14 is where that chapter 14 is where they're down they go down into the Red Sea God has opened up the waters and they're down in the bottom of the Red Sea and look at chapter 14 verse 1 and the Lord spake unto Moses saying speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and that they turn and encamp before Pehahirath between Migdal and the sea over against Baal Zephon before it shall you encamp by the sea and Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel they are entangled in the land the wilderness shall shut them in and I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after the Israelites Pharaoh didn't harden his own heart God hardened his heart because he wants him down in the bottom of the Red Sea and he wants to kill him along with his armies that he shall follow after them and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord and they did so and it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled and the heart of Pharaoh and all his servants were turned against the people and they said why have we done this why did we let him go that we have let Israel go after, after from serving us and he made ready his chariot and took his people with him and he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and the chariots even every one of them and over every one of them and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh king of Egypt and he pursued after the children of Israel and the children of Israel went out with a high hand room with a raised up hand a lifted up hand a proud hand but the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses the chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before Baal Zephon and when Pharaoh drew nigh the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold the Egyptians marched after them and they were terrified I would be too this is the largest force army in the world at that time and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord and they said unto Moses because there were no graves in Egypt hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness here they are they hadn't even got through the Red Sea and they're complaining that's like us thou hast dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt saying leave us alone Moses go away that we may serve the Egyptians they didn't want to go they're griping and complaining let us serve Satan over here Pharaoh was a picture of Satan for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in this wilderness they hadn't even got started and they start complaining I think that's what we do when we first come to the knowledge of Christ and Moses said unto the people fear ye not stand still and see the salvation of the Lord be still be quiet hush which he will show to you today for the Egyptians whom you have seen today you shall see them again no more forever you're not going to see them after today the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace and the Lord said unto Moses wherefore Christ thou unto me speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward and lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea and I behold I will I will harden the heart of the Egyptians and they shall follow them and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host upon his church upon his horsemen and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots and upon his horsemen and the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them to go before someone and go behind them is called a re reward the angel of God is protecting them 
and the, the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these Jews. They couldn't see it. That's really amazing, isn't it? The world can't see while we are seeing Christ. So that the one, the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land. It was dry. And the waters were divided. And the children of Israel, now this is amazing. Watch what God is doing. And every time they get into an encampment, they start griping and complaining. You brought us here to die. Well, that's kind of the way we are in life. I've got my car. I can't pay my car payment. I can't get the job I want. And I, I need a house and I don't have a place to live. And I've, That's what they did all the time. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea and up on dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right side and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. They were idiots. You mean a God is going to open these waters and you're stupid enough to follow in? Oh, but that was God's God hardened their hearts. Even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. Now here's what he did. And he took off their chariot wheels. He's got them in the dark where they can't see, right in the middle of the land, the dry land, in the water. There's, no, there's water around them, but that land is dry for Israel. And they drave them heavily. They tried to get their horses to move, but God had removed the progress by taking the wheels off. Now, if God can remove those wheels of this huge army that's about to run over them, you think he can't take care of you in a situation you're in instead of complaining like they're doing? And they drave their, them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. He's fighting for them. There's a God out there fighting for them. You think he can't take care of your problems? Well, they just don't have the problems that I have. Are you kidding? They get the largest army in the world on the other side of that fire, that fire and that cloud. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. And then Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength. When the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord withdrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the chariots returned and covered the and the Waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them left. Pharaoh's armies got drowned. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. <laughs> They're gone. We well, see, God can... This is amazing when you see that God destroys this army. But wait till they get to Kadesh Barnea when they start grappling again. We can't go against these giants. God's doing all the fighting. Whenever I say, Lord, you fight our battles. I mean, when I'm backed in a corner and I don't know any way out. I say, Lord, you fight this battle. I can't. The reason I pray that and I pray you're going to fight this battle because I tried to fight my battles all my life. Have you ever tried to fight them and you couldn't whip them? Well, you never will be able to. That's why I pray that. You fight my battles. I'll, I'll do the best I can. I'll follow your instructions. And I'll be like Jesus. I'll keep my mouth shut. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea. And the sea returned to his strength. 
when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, there remained not so much as one of them, but the children of Israel walked upon dry land. I don't believe it was muddy. I believe God blew so hard with the wind it dried the land up. Dried the land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. A wall of fire about me. I have nothing yet to fear. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the land of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. They saw them dead, and they keep complaining all the way through their journey in the wilderness. And they are provoking God to anger at them. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Oh, but they're not through. They're going to gripe all the way to the end. Now, this is the beginning of their complaints. And it goes all the way through Numbers and Deuteronomy. And every time they come against insurmountable odds, we can't do that. Well, God can do what he wants to do. Now, here's the beginning of the provocation of Israel against God. Provocation. Now, let's go back over here to Hebrews. This is what the Lord's talking about. We've got to match all this up. Hebrews the third chapter in verse 8 harden not your hearts he's talking to the church as in the provocation in the day of temptation the word temptation is parosmos p-e-i-r-a-s-m-o-s it means tribulation trial and this is the beginning of their trials and they start murmuring against God and that is a picture of us them being in this wilderness is a picture of you and I in this life going through it with all the trials that it has to pour out upon us and it's not going to stop until we get to be with the Lord now here's the whole thing he's saying here they will not enter into my rest because of unbelief. He said the ones that didn't enter into the rest of God, going, into, going back into Israel, the ones that didn't enter into rest is because they didn't believe God could deliver them from all these situations they were in. So God says, I'm going to kill all the unbelievers off here in Israel just like we have to... This outer man has to die, and until it is completely dead, whenever you go through hard times in life, God can take care of everything. I've come to the place in my late 70s to believing that God can handle every situation I'm in. I really didn't believe this 10 years ago. I certainly didn't believe it 20 years ago in my late 50s. I was battling, I was wrestling, and I... And I still anticipate situations that God is working on. And then I back off and say, Lord, this is yours. It's not mine. Now, he says over here, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years while you were out there in the desert. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, that generation, for those 40 years, and said, Do you always err in their heart? They have not known my ways. We as believers do not know the way that the Lord will deliver us. So I swear in the wrath, not my wrath, it says the wrath, that they should not enter into my rest. It doesn't say in my wrath. Let me, God, I got to give you something on this. 
Look over here in Psalms 95. Psalms 95. I got so many places to go here. Psalms 95. I believe it's verse 11. Psalms 95. I'm going to have to come back to some of these. All right. And look what it says. I'll come back to this. Let me put a mark in there. All right. 95. Verse. Let's read down to it. Verse 8. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Oh, I think we've, I think we read that over in Hebrews 3. And as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation. God is grieved with them because they're provoking him like he can't deliver them. After all, he is the God of the universe. He did... Uh, create all these these black holes which not, nothing can escape from them not even light can escape from them he created all of these stars that are uh, 100 million light years from here he created a he created these quasars which one of the most terrific forces in the universe it shoots it's sucking in billions of stars and shooting out a flame a trillion of miles out in space god created that and you don't think he can take care of a little bitty tiny army like pharaoh's armies or your bills or some situation you're into or your sicknesses or your ailments you don't think he can take care of it He says, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my work, 40 years long I was grieved with this generation and said, it is a people that do err in their heart. They have not known my ways. And I love verse 11 because it equates. Let me back over here. It's amazing. It equates with verse 11. Of chapter 3 of Hebrews. So I swear in my wrath. This over here says. I swear in my wrath. Well. That's wrong too. What do you mean that's wrong? It's a bad translation. My wrath is not my wrath. Alright. Now. So I swore in my wrath. Over there in. Over there in Hebrews 3.11. Te or gay. The, it actually says the wrath. It says the wrath, the tau ada, ada, on the end of word is always feminine. Now who is angry here? Whose anger starts all this off? The anger of the people, isn't it? They have an attitude of or gay. This Ada here is feminine. So it can't be God's wrath. It's not possible it's God's wrath. It actually says, if they translated this the way it says it in the original text, the translators couldn't afford to translate it the way it says it because it looks like this wrath, this fury and rage of the people came from God. And it did. Or gay is feminine because, because over here uh, in, in Revelation, 17 and 5. Revelation was the, uh, Babylon was the mother of all harlotry. And Babylon is a mother 
Babylon is a mother, feminine, and they founded all idolatry. Then the, what is the idolatry they were worshiping in the wilderness? Self. All idolatry started at Babylon when they said, let us, let us make us a name. That's a feminine. And when anybody steals from you or beats you out of attention or something that you think belongs to you, they have an orgay, a wrath, an anger of rage, of covetousness. And the Ada is feminine gender. And where did man get this anger from? Well, he got it here in, in, uh, Rev in Romans 1. Romans 1. I'll get to it here. My Bible's coming apart, and I can't hardly flip the pages. All right. Romans 1. This is one of Dave's favorite verses. Verse 18. Huh? Verse 18. I can't hear you. Yeah, <laughs> he likes this. He's always giving it to somebody. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. That word wrath is or gay. It's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. That word against is the word epi. It means upon. It's revealed upon all men. It's orge is revealed upon from heaven against or upon ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That wrath is that orge, feminine orge, is put upon man by God. Now this is very important because let's go back over here to this verse 11 of chapter 95. Now, is this the same word or gay? Well, it's not because this is written in Hebrew. But when you go to the Septuagint, LXX, I remember looking it up years ago, and I thought I'd recheck myself just as I left the house and it's just what it says. But whom I swear in say or gay in the Septuagint. Septuagint was the translation by Greek translators and Hebrew translators of the Old Testament scripture into the the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek in two hundred BC. Whoever the translators were here, they got it wrong. Because it says te or gay in the Greek in the Greek Septuagint. Now, so it's saying the same thing. Now let's go back to Hebrews. So I swore in te or gay, it's the wrath and the anger of the people. What God is angry at these unbelievers because they don't believe Him. Well, Jim, I thought God ordained that. He did. He ordains even his own wrath. He ordains the minds of evil men to say the words they say. Look over here in Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16 and 1. 16 and 1. Everything is ordained by God. He's doing all things. He said, I make peace and create evil. He creates evil through the minds of evil men, just like when they killed Jesus. They murdered Jesus, and Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. And they were there. All the Jews were there screaming, crucify him. And Pilate was there, and Herod was there. And the Roman soldiers were there, and they were therefore to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. God determined the murder of Jesus. Wherever you find evil in the Bible, I make peace and create evil. Then how does, why does God get angry? He wants his anger. 
God wants to be angry. If he didn't want any anger ever in the history of the world, could he possibly have made man without any ability to be angry? Well, yeah, he's going to do that in eternity, isn't he? He's going to give us per perfect bodies that can't sin. But he could have done it from the beginning. Why didn't he do that? He didn't want to. He works all things after the counts of his own will. Now, go back over here to Hebrews. We're talking about the people in the wilderness are equal. The believers in the wilderness are equal to those of us who are believers over here. And with us, God has got to get rid of all of this contention and strife and arrogance and, and everything that keeps us. This dead man, the outer man, has, has to die. Just like these dead men over here, they have to become dead, and God's going to kill off all the unbelief over here. This in the wilderness is the exact picture of the church in the wilderness that we're in. Now, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Your old evil heart has to die. In departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we, for we are made partakers of Christ, if we, be, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke God. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Who was he grieved with? The unbelievers in the wilderness. Who is he grieved with in our life? With the unbelieving outer man. That's who he's, he said he's angry at is this outer man, and he's going to see to it that this outer man gives up and surrenders to him and comes to a place of spiritual rest or spiritual Sabbath. And he compares the Sabbath with the people in the wilderness. They wouldn't believe God, so he says, I have to kill that off. Until God kills off all unbelief in your heart, you'll be fighting back with that outer man. You can't make it subdue. All you can do is say, Lord, please help me to learn not to fight this world, because if I fight this world, I'm wasting my time. I'm trying to take up for myself, and self is not dying. You have to pray, Lord, help me to surrender to you. Then he goes on to say, with whom was he grieved? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness over a 40-year period? So we're going to have to study all that. To him swear he that they should not enter into his catapulsis. Rest. And that is equated with the Sabbath in the next chapter. It's actually equated with it in this chapter. He said, but to them that did not believe that God could overcome the world, could overcome the wilderness. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. He killed off all those unbelieving people. And we're going to go through and see these people that he killed off. And he, if you want to fight somebody, you're fighting the wrong person when you're fighting, when you're fighting the situation. The situations were ordained by God until you come up and you start saying, I surrender, Lord. I'm not going to fight anymore. But you can't control those juices in your body. The only person that can control them is God. You can say, yeah, I'm never going to get over this. I know you're not. If you ever get over self, it'll be God that brings it about in your life. And notice what he does with these words. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering in to his rest, equating that with us entering into the settling down in our belief and understanding that all the problems in our life are to get rid of this outer man that likes to fight everybody when it is done wrong. And these people over here in this wilderness thought they were being done wrong. 
Then he says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. The gospel was preached unto them. How was the gospel preached unto the children of Israel in the wilderness? The gospel is a resurrection, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul said, I declare to you the gospel, and that is that Christ was dead, buried, and resurrected again the third day. Well, Israel is over here in Egypt. Aren't, weren't they dead there in, in Egypt for 400 years, and then they're being resurrected and taken to the promised land? Weren't they resurrected? This is the resurrection that was preached to them. For unto us was the gospel preached as well unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. Those that were killed off in the wilderness, those who never die the death, they never, this outer man never comes alive in them, that's because they have no inner man and they're going to hell one day. But it, this, has, this has nothing to do with how you feel about who you are. It has to do with whether you believe God or not. You say, but I can't get over myself. Well, yes, I know that. But you will. And it won't be you that does it. It'll be God that does it in you. It's God that works in you to willing to do of his good pleasure. And he compares all through here this kataposis as the rest of the Sabbath day. And God's going to have to take the believer's out here in Israel, through all of these trials they're going to go through until he kills all this unbelief off. And as we study through Numbers and Deuteronomy, you're going to watch God kill off all these unbelievers. And it's just called unbelief. It is another man in you, but it's the outer man. For unto us was the gospel reached. I read that. Verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest. That's the word called apostles. As he said, as I have sworn in the wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. It was already settled by God who would enter into rest by belief. Notice it doesn't say, whoever enters into rest by feeling like they understand it are they getting it together you won't never feel like you feel like you're getting it together nobody will that's a believer you'll always say but i got this sin in me i can't get rid of it well you are getting rid of it by recognizing the fact that you've got it for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day now he's going to bring in the sabbath sabbath with the cult of apostles. he's mixing the two he spoke again of the seventh day on this wise, and God did kataposis on the Sabbath. So the kataposis is, that's when you believe God, that's when you'll say all these things are of God, no matter if you, if you lose a loved one or if you, whatever it is, it's all happening in God's time because he works all things after the counsel of his own will, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God did rest the seventh day. So what he's talking about, that word rest that God did on the seventh day is caught our pauses. Caught our pauses is, caught our means down. Pauses is our word pause. It means to pause down or settle down. The one who believes God, eventually you'll settle down in this belief. And you'll stop worrying about what's going to happen. In this place, again, if they shall enter into my kataposis, so if they'll settle down, seeing therefore it is remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. The word unbelief is the word A-P-I-S-T-I-S. -I Pistis is the word believe, and the alpha placed in front of that, the alpha primitive, negates the word. It means no belief, no faith. The ones that died in the wilderness are the ones that had no faith. They were always complaining and griping when they'd come to a place with no water. We need water. We're tired of this matter. We, we need meat. 
God says, I'll give you meat. I'll give you doves till it comes out your nostrils. You think I don't know how to take care of you? And then he says, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying, In David, today after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts in unbelief. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day. If he'd have given them rest in the wilderness, he says, I've got a better rest for all of you. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. That word rest is the word Sabbath. He is intermingling this word Sabbath with the word called apostles. Called apostles is what you do on the Sabbath, you settle down. And he's saying, the way you do that is through believing God is doing everything. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. You're ceasing from your sin, but it doesn't happen all at once. You learn to cease and you learn more to cease. Hath ceased is an aorist indicative. But hath ceased, an aorist indicative, shows that it started in the past and if the word calls for it, it continues every day. You have ceased and you're continuing to cease. That would be an aorist indicative constative. You're constantly ceasing from your sin. You're ceasing less. You're doing less sin today. This inner man never sins. And the outer man is ceasing a little at a time through all the fire and the trials. And God will cause you to surrender and give up one day. He's really done that in my life. I've really just, I'm going real slow now. I don't get angry. I don't have that problem anymore like I used to. I have, I have righteous indignation. I'm angry with what people do to God and His Word. I have an anger at preachers who lie to the American public and lie to the believers. Now, then he says, this is really something that he says now. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into God's catapulses. Let us work to enter into his rest. When we labor, it means to make an effort earnestly, diligently, to cease from your sin. He says the same thing in First Peter where he says right here, let us labor to enter into God's rest. Over here in 1 Peter, he says those same words. I'm um, Excuse me, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 4 and verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Hath ceased is an aorist indicative and it's talking, of that word has ceased is the word katapasis. He's saying that you have ceased, this inner man has ceased, and you're causing the outer man to cease. I wrote a note down here. How long does it take to put, put on the inner man and learn to rest? The amount of time to kill off the outer man. Whatever time that is, God will want to, God wants to get rid of that outer man. Now, now he actually says the Sabbath. He equates it all through here with the call to apostles, with the resting, and that's compared with believing God. If you believe God, you don't believe in God, and you don't believe God if you don't believe everything he says and everything he puts you through. Now, let's go back over here, and let's look at some of these times that Israel got all been out of shape and angry in the flesh. Look back over here. Ephesians, not Ephesians, Exodus. I'll get it right in a minute. Exodus, the 16th chapter. Exodus 16. Now, we started off showing you how that you got Genesis 1 through 50. That ends with Joseph. 
you have Exodus, and th they call it Exodus because it was an Exodus from Egypt. Now, then you have Leviticus, the Levitical law, Levitical law. Then Numbers. Numbers is a very interesting book because when you get to the 10th chapter of Numbers, they're leaving Mount Sinai, and they're heading up here to Kadesh or Kadesh Barnea, which is just below Israel, Kadesh. Boy, there was a great big confrontation between Israel and God at that point. And they're just saying, you're wanting us to go in there and fight those giants, Moses? We can't go in there and do that. And for 40, 40 days and nights, these men, 20 years old and upward, were sent in to spout the land of Anak. And the Anakims were giant men. And they were of the land of Anak. That was, that was the land of, the, of what, during the days of Israel, they called it the land of the Philistines. And today we call it the Gaza Strip on the southwest corner of Israel. And they said, we can't do that. Now, I just want to read some of these complaints. Look here in Exodus, the 16th chapter. Well, I don't know if I did the 15th chapter yet. They start griping and complaining just like the believer does when he's a baby believer. You've got little faith, and that outer man has to be killed off. That's called maturity. Jesus says the last verse of the sixth chapter of Matthew, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Perfect is the word teleos. It doesn't mean to be without sin. It means be mature. Be grown up. Stop being babies. Well, he needed to tell them that. That was his first message. It was the Sermon on the Mount. And these were all babies that he was preaching to because he had never preached to them before. Nobody else was preaching. Now, look here in Exodus. I've got so many illustrations on this. I'm going to have to, it's going to take me a good while to go through it. Exodus, the, was there somewhere in the 15? Let me go to 15 first. 15, and there, now, remember, in Exodus, the 14th chapter, that's where they, they've just crossed, they've just crossed the Red Sea. Hadn't had time to do anything. And they start grappling. They could grapple over the least thing here. It's like, you can deliver us from Pharaoh's armies and bring all those things on Egypt, but can you give us water? Duh, no, I'm just God. I can't do that. <coughs> Verse 22, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They're just getting over the, just getting over the dry land. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, my wife's name, Mary, comes from that. It means bitter. They could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses. They start griping. Gosh. Why don't you give Moses a chance to get you some water? They started griping. They were murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we go to drink? What are we going to drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. They, were, they, could, be, they could drink now. There he made for them a stature and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And he said, Wilt thou diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all these statutes? I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon Egypt, upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's a charismatic verse. They say, 
none of these diseases will I bring upon you. He said, I won't bring upon you that I brought upon Egypt, but I will bring upon people. And it don't mean I won't bring any cancer or any, it means I won't bring any flies on you. I won't bring any darkness on you. I won't bring any gnats on you. I won't bring any death of your firstborn on you that I brought upon Egypt. He's not talking about you won't get sick. Like Benny Hinn says, he quotes this verse all the time. Twist it all to pieces. Now, look here in the 16th chapter. You're going to watch them gripe and complain. They're out here in the wilderness. They're in that, I'll keep reminding you. They're out here in this tongue of the Red Sea. They're out here and they're headed down south to get to Mount Sinai. And watch them gripe. And that's a picture of us. Boy, if we really believe God. But you can't when you first start out. It's not possible. Now look here in 16, verse 2. Well, let's read into it. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, that's the northern part of that, S-I-N is a part of the uh, Sinai Peninsula, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month, after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation, the children of Israel, murmured, provoking God again. When God says in the day of provocation, He don't mean one day. He meant all the time they're going through the wilderness, that's a picture of us in this world. And Israel was, the Bible says, Israel was the church. The church in the wilderness, that's what the Bible says in Acts, the seventh chapter. When Stephen is standing before the Sanhedrin, look what he says over there. The word church is the word ecclesia. E K K L E S I A. It means to call kaleo out, ek. Get our word exit from that. They were called out of Egypt, weren't they? Well, certainly they were. Look over here in Acts. Stephen is the first martyr of the church. He was one of the first deacons. Deacons were chose. Diakonos was, was a household slave and they were to feed the widows and the orphans so the apostle wouldn't have to go to this administration also. And look over here in Acts 7, and Stephen stands before the Sanhedrin of the judging council at Jerusalem, and he gives the entire story. If you want to read the entire story of Israel from a New Testament viewpoint, you read this chapter. And he starts off talking about Abraham. And he said, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Well, we know he was in the land of Haran. That was the same thing. Mesopotamia means between the rivers. And the rivers, the two rivers was uh, Euphrates and the Tigris. The capital city of the Assyrian Empire was on the, Euphra was on the Tigris River. And it was right about where Baghdad is, if you can see it there. Here's the Tigris River up here, about right in here. Well, it could have been on up here, Nineveh. Uh, and then Babylonian, uh, the Babylonian Empire was seated here on, the, on that river. And Abraham was down there, wasn't he? What was he doing down there? He was in the lineage of Shem who settled in that area. So he had to be called out of, he had to be called out of Babylon to go to Israel to inherit a land that God would show him there in Genesis, the 12th chapter. Now, here in the 7th chapter, he's standing before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a judging council at Jerusalem. Seventy men. And he goes into Abraham and circumcision and goes on down in here into them being in Egypt uh, and tells you all the details. And he gets over here in verse 36. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, 
in the wilderness forty years, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, that's quoted from Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. These people who say that Israel is not the church, well, the Bible says he was the church, that, it, that the church was in the wilderness and Jesus was with them. Now, let's go back over here to the 16th chapter. And here they go again, complaining. This is the day of Israel provoked God. He said, I'm going to kill off all the unbelief in your life. I'm going to get rid of that outer man. When you've been a believer for, like I have, for 70 years, I was about, best I remember of believing God is about seven years old. It may have been for that. But I've been a believer a long time. And then he says, all right. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God you, we had died in the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots. We had plenty to eat, a lot of meat to eat. And when we did eat bread to the full, got all we wanted, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. You thank God. <laughs> that is nearly funny. You know, and God can destroy all of Pharaoh's armies. Everybody in the world was afraid of Pharaoh and his armies. And God destroyed them. And they say, you got us out here and we're going to starve to death. We don't have anything to drink, anything to eat. Then said the Lord unto Moses, you think this is provoking God? through unbelief that's exactly what we're in is unbelief then said the lord unto moses behold i'll rain bread from heaven for you how's that for food you think i can't supply i can rain it out of the sky and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that i may prove them i'm going to put them in the trial and the fire whether they will walk in my law or not. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. I'm going to give them twice as much on Friday because you got the Sabbath coming up on Saturday. And they can't work on Saturday. And it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel. Now what happens if they, if they try to, to hold some over to the next day? Any other day, it gets rotten and full of worms. But God makes it good bread for the Sabbath. If you gather more than you're supposed to gather on Thursday to hold it over to Friday, it's going to be wormy and it's going to stink. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, At evening, then you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for, they, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. It always says against God. And sometimes it will say they murmured against Moses. They murmured against Aaron. God, you just don't know my situation. You think you've had ever, ever had a harder situation than being in the middle of the desert with no way to eat, and the only way it's going to be is God's going to have to supply? And what are we that you murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings when you murmur against him, this is not murmuring just to be murmuring. It's murmuring against God. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. We're just doing the will of God. And you're saying that God can't take care of you. And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. 
And it came to pass as Aaron spake into the whole congregation of the children of Israel. Remember, Aaron is the spokesman because when God told him to, told Moses to go before Pharaoh, Moses said, but I'm a thick tongue, I'm tongue tied, I can't talk, Lord. So he said, Aaron will be your prophet. It wasn't like Moses was some great authority standing up there and saying, by the Lord God, uh, let my people go. He couldn't get the words out of his mouth. He was tongue tied. See, God doesn't want somebody that's a great leader. He wants faithfulness. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And look toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Now, here's one of the, here's one of the miracles of God. How much time do I have, Mike? Thirteen. Oh, goodness, I'm not even getting started on this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying... At even, evening you shall eat flesh, and the morning you shall be filled with bread. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that, e that at evening the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. Host is the bread. That's why the Roman Catholics call the Eucharist the host, the bread. Well, that's not true among the Catholics. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one unto another, What is it? That's actually what they said. What is it? It is manna. The word manna means what is it? Mon, M-A-W-N. What is it? Sometimes I'll ask Mary, what are you cooking? She'll say, manna. <laughs> <laughs> it is manna, for they knew not what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. And then he compares himself to that bread in John the 6th chapter. Remember that? L let me show you that real quick. You get all your answers from the old to the new, back and forth. John 6. John 6. And Jesus said, that's actually me. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Indeed is the word aletheis. It means of truth. You eat and drink it of truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. I'm the truth. And then he says here in John 6, you get your answers looking from one to the other. John 6, verse 32. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. He says, That's me. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And he says over here in verse, verse 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. That's the way they survived in the wilderness. I am the living bread. I'm not just that bread over there in the Old Testament which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. And then he tells you what the flesh is. He says, I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Not everybody in the world. God so loved the world. So is an adverb. Tells her in what fashion he loved. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat, which is the bread? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This is the very image. The Old Testament is the shadow. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. Indeed is the word alethes. He said, here is the very image. That bread over in the Old Testament was a shadow of what I'm going to do. A-L-E-T-H-E-S of truth. Indeed is of truth. 
And truth is the word aletheia, A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. It comes from lanthano, meaning to lie hid. When you place the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, in front of a word as a negative particle, that is that is the word alanthano or aletheia. It means not to hide anything. Lanthano means to hide or conceal. When you eat flesh and drink blood, you don't conceal anything. The Old Testament was just a shadow. Now back, back over there. My flesh is meat and drink. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Now, go back over here to Exodus. They can't quit complaining. This is the provocation. The way you enter in to God's rest, no matter what comes in your life, you say, Lord, I thank you for this bread. I thank you for these crackers. I thank you for this simple way of living, these beans and potatoes. Whatever you've given me is fine. This is that which the Lord commanded over here, back over here in Exodus, the 16th chapter. Gather of it every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which is in his tents. And look down here in verse 17. The children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less, because they had more in the family. And when they did measure it out with, a, with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, he that gathered little had no lack. God's going to supply whatever the lack is. They gathered every man according to his eating, and Moses said, let no man leave it till the morning. Don't leave it till the next day. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stunk. I told you that a while ago. And Moses was wroth with them because they weren't believing what God said. But when they kept some the next morning from the sixth day, it didn't stink and it didn't have worms. Because that was the promise of God. God makes things work that don't seem to be able to work. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. When the sun waxed hot, it melted. And so forth. Now, I want to keep on reading. I've got so much more to get to. Get to. Now, let me get to another complaint of the Jews. Go to Numbers 14. Boy, they didn't ever, wait a minute, I already gave you that, didn't I? No, I didn't. Numbers 14. Not Exodus 14. Numbers 14. Now, they have left Mount Sinai by this point. Mount Sinai was in the southern part of the peninsula, down here in the bottom, down here. And they're, they've just left Sinai and the tenth chapter. I may have to wait till next week because this is going to be a long chapter. All right. Numbers. Actually, I need to go to Numbers 11 first. Uh, go to Numbers 11. I may be able to say a few things. Am I about out of time? Four minutes. Huh? Four minutes. Okay. I may read some of the first part of this, and this is one of their big, big gripes. Now, 11. Goodness, how can I start here? They're leaving Mount Sinai in verse 33 of chapter 10. Look down here, chapter, verse 33 of chapter 10. They departed from the Mount of the Lord three days journey they're leaving Sinai in the southern uh, peninsula they came to Sinai in Exodus the 18th chapter then that's before Moses got the law he got the law starting in the 20th chapter of Exodus if you can remember that or write it down and they departed from Sinai, the Mount of the Lord. It says they came to the Mount of the Lord in the 18th chapter of Exodus. They're leaving the mountain of God, and they're taking with them all of these laws, and they're headed north, 
They're headed north towards Mount, towards uh, Kadesh Barnea. That's just below Israel. And the three days journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days to, to search out a resting place for them. Where can we go rest? And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day when they went out of the camp. The Bible speaks of that cloud of the Lord. This is one of the many miracles of God, a cloud by day and a fire by night to lead the way. And I believe that's in the 14th chapter of Exodus. I believe that's where it is. Yeah. Now in the 13th chapter, verse 21, the Lord went before them <coughs> by, <coughs> by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them by the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. This is one of the reasons the Pharisees came to Jesus in the 16th chapter of Matthew and said, give us a sign. We've always gotten signs. He said, you're not going to get any more signs except the sign of the prophet Jonah. That was he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then resurrection. He said, that's all you get from now on. You're going to get any more of these miracles for signs. And he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now, back over here in chapter 13 of Numbers. They departed from the mount of the Lord in verse 33. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day when they went out of the camp in verse 34. And it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered. He's praying to the Lord, You have some enemies. They're not mine. They're yours. You scatter them. Moses is saying the same thing. I pray all the time, Lord, you fight my battles. I, I tried fighting them myself for years. And trying to fight evil men out here in the world doesn't work. And let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. And when the people griped again, and it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, these are the days of provocation. When they are, and the way you get through the wilderness is you learn to believe God no matter what you come across. He's talking about the same thing in the third chapter. And he says, the way you get through it is you learn to rest in it and say, God, this is your job, not mine. Because you've already ordained it from the foundation of the world. And I'm out of time. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll come back to the 11, 11th chapter. I want you to see some of the things that he's talking about. Have you noticed belief, rest on the Sabbath, and all these trials and tribulations? Every time you find tribulation in the Bible, we must see much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. All that will of God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. No man should be moved by these afflictions, knowing that you are appointed thereto, because you're in the spiritual wilderness in the world. We've got all these enemies that hate God. A bunch of Baptists and a bunch of Church of Christ and Pentecostals and Catholics. I'm going to come back next week, and we're going to resume here in the 11th chapter and look at the people being angry Look at them getting angry because they keep, they come up and say, you brought us in the wilderness to die. Uh, who are you to think you are, Moses, being our leader? I got a, I have a right to offer incense to God too. They're grappling about everything. We are not supposed to be complaining because God compares us with those people in the wilderness. He said, I'm going to have to kill off your old man your outer man. And that takes us back to the inner and the outer man in the New Testament there and uh, putting on the new man in Colossians, the third chapter, and Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and getting rid of the old man, getting rid of the outer man. I hope you all can see this. All of this is a shadow and an image, very image. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Thank you for your word. Help us to realize that we have to become settled in this thing of the inner and the outer man. The outer man has to die 
just like all those unbelievers had to die. And whenever what we have with the outer man is a dead man, like Paul said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? We have a dead man in us, and he wants to serve self. Thank you for the years of trial in my own life. So you've gotten rid of a whole lot of that old man. Lord, we'll give you praise for all things. Lead us to your elect in Christ's name. Amen. Now you know what's wrong with you. You got a dead man hanging around you.